Think about the Roman soldiers that actually held the nails and drove them in. And as terrible and as bad as that seems to us, He was dying for them just like He was dying for you and me. Those that turned to Him, the centurion that the Bible speaks of, that says, surely this was the Son of God. Amen? Yeah. That man, <coughs> salvation through faith in what Jesus did, even though he was one of the soldiers, may have been one, I don't know if he was one that, that drove the nail, but he certainly stood by and was guard to it or watched over it. Surely this was the Son of God. Salvation is freely given, not on our own merit, but because of the mercy and the grace of God. God's mercy defined is unmerited love and favor. You cannot earn it. You can try, but you can't. The only way to obtain God's mercy and His favor and justification and sanctification and salvation is through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ and what He did on the cross. When the thief turned to Him, as Brother Slee said, on the cross and said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. We see a profession of faith. We see a profession of faith by this man who had been a lifetime criminal, maybe, whatever the case may be. He certainly had done some things wrong because he turns to the other one and says, we're here. We deserve to be here. Yeah. We're not here because we're falsely accused is what he was saying. We deserve. We are guilty of our crimes. But he turns to Jesus and with some of, the, some of the last energy that he would have in his human body, some of the last breath that he would have, he said, today you will be with me in paradise because this thief see we think it takes a long drawn out sinner's prayer actually what it takes is a moment of faith it takes a profession of faith not, not that's just a moment but a profession of faith when you believe that's why it says when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ you will be saved because when you put your faith there when you believe and that's what that thief did that's what that centurion did that's what the apostle Paul did on the road to Damascus when he said, Who art thou, Lord? Amen? And he said, I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. Paul put his faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what saves us today. Not how good we are. Is it good to be good? Yes, it is. It's good. Are good works good? Yes, they are. But you can do them from the time you're born to the time you die. They will not gain you entrance into heaven. Amen? Many people believe that. Their religion teaches that. They, go, they, they live a life of suffrage. They give up everything they've got to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to take care of the poor and the hurting and the dying. And all of that is admirable. All of that is, 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 worth, is a worthwhile effort while in this life. But none of that, none of that will save your soul. None of that will justify you when you stand before a holy and a righteous God because no matter what effort we put forth in this life, our righteousness, no matter how good it is, will be filthy rags in comparison to the holiness and the righteousness of God. And basically that's what we've been talking about for three or four weeks now. I didn't preach last Sunday morning. Brother Mike did, did a wonderful job and I appreciated him coming and ministering to us in word and it was really, really good. We've been talking about Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Hebrews 11 and 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. By what? By faith. Faith in what? Certainly not their works. The Bible teaches us plainly that's not, that that is not it. But we've been learning that it was faith in the promise to come. Whenever they would cut the little lamb and his blood would spill out on the altar, it wasn't so much faith in that this lamb is where I'm putting my faith. It was faith in that which the lamb represented. Faith on the other side of the cross. You, you can say, well, that was a dispensation of law and now we're in the dispensation of grace. Actually, we've always been under grace. Because Noah, how, him and his, how was him and his family saved? The Bible says Noah found grace in the sight, of, in the eyes of the Lord. Amen? So anyone that was saved from Adam's time 
until the last man standing will be saved one way, and that is through grace. And that grace comes but now by putting your faith in that which happened on the cross of Calvary. Then, before the cross, their faith was in that promise that God had promised. Mm -hmm. Just as Abraham, Jesus said, saw his day. He saw his day. He saw through eyes of faith the promise that God had promised. When the priest would sacrifice the animals and go through all of the rituals in the temple in the Old Testament tabernacle, it was all pointing to one thing. That day on Calvary when the Son of the living God would hang between heaven and earth and say it is finished. And the temple veil would be rent in twain from top to bottom. You can say, well, no, it, the, the victory wasn't won to the resurrection. Oh, but the Bible doesn't back that up. The Bible doesn't say the temple veil was rent in twain at the resurrection. The Bible doesn't say that the temple veil was rent in twain when Jesus won a battle in hell. The Bible says the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, meaning it gave access for man to enter into the throne throne room of God when? When he hung on the cross and said it is finished and he gave up the ghost brothers least that's where the victory was won amen the cross was not dependent upon the resurrection the resurrection was dependent upon the cross and we talk whenever we talk about the victory of the cross or when we talk about putting our faith in the finished work of the cross all of that 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 that, income, that compasses the the death the burial and the resurrection but trust me the Bible teaches plainly that the victory was won on the cross of Calvary. It, comes, it goes as far to say that He put principalities to shame. That He made a show of them openly whenever they nailed Him to the old rugged cross and He said it is finished because that's why He came. When He stood before Pilate, He said, For this cause came I into the world to lay down His life as the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world as John the Baptist proclaimed there whenever he was baptizing in the River Jordan. So that's what we've been talking about. We've been talking about how the elders obtained a good report. How Abraham was saved. How the prophets were saved. How those before the cross were saved. Before the cross in a sense as far as the event taking place in human history. But John said he saw a lamb that had been slain before the foundation of the world. And what that means is Jesus Christ had already accepted the Father's will. He had already laid down His will and His life in eternity past to come in the form of man, to redeem man, to reconcile man back to the place that He once was with God. Not just to that place, but even greater. Even greater than Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Man would be reconciled through the blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. The Bible says we are brought nigh how? We are brought close to God or nigh to God not by our works. As good as works are, we are brought nigh, the Bible says, by the blood. We are brought nigh by the blood. When that priest would enter into the Holy of Holies, he went in there not as a perfect man, there was only one, there's only been one perfect man in the history of mankind, and that was Jesus Christ. That priest went in there with faith in the blood that had been sacrificed and applied to the altar. And not just faith, because even, even in its purest form, that blood was not holy. But what, what it represented was that picture, that type, that shadow that it was to that which would come, that supreme sacrifice. That's why the Bible teaches us that the Old Testament sacrifices of the bulls and the bullocks and the lambs, all of those things could not take away sin, only cover it. It was only a temporal thing until the perfect thing got here. Oh, hallelujah. It was only a temporal fix for that which God would fix permanent with the blood of Jesus Christ. And now, our sins, Brother Rodney, are not covered. Covered means it's still there. Our sins today are taken away as far as the east is from the west through the blood of Jesus Christ. So we see in the teaching of the Word of God that man is justified by faith. Before the cross, they were justified by the faith in that which was to come. On this side of the cross, we are justified by the faith in that which has already happened. When you get over there and you meet Moses and the rest of them, Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah, 
They got there the same way you did. <laughs> it wasn't because they were great. It wasn't because they were perfect. When you meet King David on the streets of gold and have a Holy Ghost fit, it won't be because David was a perfect man. Amen? It'll be because David had his faith in the right place. If you make it to heaven and walk on the streets of gold, it won't be because you were a good Pentecostal. It won't be because you were a good Baptist. It won't be because you were a good Mormon or a good Catholic or a good Buddhist. You may be because you put your faith and your trust and your hope in what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. When we stand before Him, He will not have a record of our works and say, well, because you did this, then you are saved. Because you fed the hungry, you are saved. Because you lived right, you are saved. No, He will say your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Why? Because your blood has your your roles have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. We overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony today, not by our works. You can live as holy and as perfect as a as possible for a human being to do, and it won't be good enough. You can try to keep every one of the Ten Commandments. And there's a lot more than ten. That just doesn't mean we got up there. All of the things that were commanded in the Old Testament under the law, you can try to keep those and you'll find that you fall short, way short of where you need to be. That's why Jesus came to fulfill the law. We talked about Adam and Eve. How they in the garden whenever they sinned. When we find the first sin, we find the first sacrifice. When we find man's first sin, we find the first sacrifice for man. Whenever we find man sinning in the garden, what's the first thing that he does? He tries to cover it up. He tries to fix the problem himself. That's what we do. Brother Rodney tries to fix himself. Brother Billy tries to fix himself. We cannot fix ourselves. People will say, I'll come to church when I'm good enough. Yeah. Well, I'll never see you because you'll never be good enough. Yeah, that's right. None of us will ever be good enough. Does that condone sin? Does that make it complacent? Does that mean it, it that, does that make it permissible? Permissible? The apostle Paul said, God forbid. But it does not make us holy. Being able to walk the line that man has set does not make you holy. Dressing right does not make you holy in the sight of God. True holiness only comes through the blood of the Lamb. True justification only comes through the blood of the Lamb. So Adam and Eve, they see Him. Their eyes are open. And the first thing they do is they sew fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They made themselves their own covering. Man is still doing that today. We see that in the Garden of Eden all the way to the year of 2013. Man is still trying to cover it up today with his own works, with his own righteousness. I told you before, we feel better some days because we feel like that we have lived a better life. Maybe we feel holier because we didn't lose our temper. Maybe we feel holier because we spent all day at the soup kitchen feeding the homeless. And we feel better about ourselves. Well, that's great and that's good. But you're no more saved today because you fed the homeless than you are yesterday when you didn't. Because salvation only comes through faith in Jesus Christ and no other way. But God would come walking through the garden like He had before to fellowship with mankind. And what would Adam and Eve do? They hid themselves amongst the trees of the garden. Because they heard God, they were afraid. Because they had taken that which they weren't supposed to. They had rebelled. Now, it doesn't say they hid before God showed up. Sometimes you might feel good about your self-righteousness. Sometimes you might feel good about the works that you do and it may make you feel more holy. But I guarantee you this. When you stand in the presence of an all-holy God, what you've done will fade in comparison to His righteousness and His holiness and you're talking about bringing it home to where the rubber meets the road, you will realize everything I've done is not good enough. All the works that I did were not good enough. Someone used to sing a song, if I had all the riches this world had to give, and I gave them all away, every penny, every nickel to my name, 
to some lowly beggar on life's rugged way, it wouldn't be enough to buy one splinter of the tree that Jesus died on. If I give my body to be burned to warm those that are cold, if I give the last stitch of clothing off of my back, if I take everything I've got in this life to feed those that are hungry, it will not save my soul. Only faith in Jesus Christ and His finished work, only that faith placed in the right place will save my soul today. So what does the Lord do when Adam and Eve hide themselves from Him? We read this before. I'm not going to read it all. The thing we hit home on was the fact that the Lord made coats of skins and clothed them. And where did these skins come from, Brother Sleece? They came from a sacrificed animal. They came from a sacrificed animal. You see, by one man, sin, well, sin entered into the world. By one man, it was taken away. <laughs> not And not, not a carnal... Not a work of carnal hands, but that one man being Christ Jesus, the Son of the living God, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, that had came to dwell with us, took sin away. That which man messed up, only God could fix. It would do us all good today if we could get that in this thick skull of ours. That which is messed up, only man messed up. I'm talking about we messed it up. Only God can fix it. Only God can fix it. Now when you read on there in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 4, the very first example of faith whenever it comes to the Lord speaking about human beings here in this chapter. It says in verse 4 of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and this is what I want to talk about for just a few minutes today. It says, By faith... Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Righteous how? By faith. That he had offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. The first one that it makes mention of here is Cain and Abel. So turn with me to the book of Genesis, the fourth chapter. Cain and Abel, as you well know, were the sons of Adam and Eve. We find them in the fourth chapter. The Bible says, beginning of the fourth chapter, the first verse in the book of Genesis, And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, the Bible says it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Now the first thing I want to ask you today is how did they know to bring an offering? How did they know to bring a sacrifice? How did they know to build an altar? They had to have been taught this from Adam. This is not something that they just came up with on their own. How did Adam know? From the time that him and Eve fell and that God used animal skins to clothe them. So Adam knew that it took a blood sacrifice. He passes it on down to his sons that it takes a blood sacrifice. Here's how you do it. I learned it the hard way. <laughs> As Brother Isaac said one day, he said, I learned that the hard way. Here's how you do it. You make the altar. There has to be blood. Amen? Amen? So what do these two sons do? One of them doesn't bring a blood sacrifice. It says in the process of time, Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering of the Lord. The work of his hands. He was a tiller of the ground. That which he had grown. That which he had nurtured. That which he had, that's what he, which he had put his sweat and his blood into. I have no doubt he was a great gardener. I have no doubt that that which he brought to God was probably, if we looked at it in the carnal eyes, we would have thought, man, that's some good looking fruit or good looking vegetables. Yeah. That's some good looking stuff that he brought. Amen. It, you, you think about, especially during the Thanksgiving season, how you'll see it laid out there, the different vegetables that they have and how pretty they are. 
His offering probably looked acceptable in the eyes and the sight of man. Yeah. It was probably the best that he had. Yeah. Listen to me. Listen to me. Cain probably went meticulously over the things that he had raised and the things that he had grown, Brother Sleeves, and the things that he had sweated over and put his blood into. And he thought, this is the best. Oh, this is the best stuff I've ever grown. This is the best that I've got. And he brings the best that he has. I hope you hear this this morning you don't hear nothing else. He brings the best that he has and he puts it before God and guess what? It ain't good enough. The best that you have, the best work that you can come up with, the best deeds that you have done will not be good enough to sacrifice on the altar before God because it takes a blood offering for God to respect. There is no respect found for Cain's offering. Why? Was it rotten fruit? No. The Bible doesn't say that. He brought an offering, the fruit of the ground, an offering unto the Lord, the best that he had. Mm -hmm. This is the best that I've got. Surely God's going to accept that. So many people going through this life believing that they do, they're going to do the best that they can. When they stand before God, He's going to accept them because of the best that they did. Mm -hmm. No, he's, he's, if you're going to be accepted in the, into the kingdom of heaven, if you're going to be accepted by a thrice holy God, it's going to be because you have faith in the best that he has. Oh, hallelujah. And not the best that you have. The best that I've got in, the, in comparison to God is filthy rags. It says in verse 4, And Abel, and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. They had to have been taught these offerings, the ceremony and the way that things had to be. He brought his offering and the fat thereof. Man don't just come up with stuff that pleases God. We have to be instructed. Yeah. We have to be taught. Mm -hmm. Amen. And it has to be original. We may have heard it from Mama. Mama might have heard it from Grandma. But Grandma, if it's the correct instruction, she first heard it from God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, Cain and Abel, they heard it from Daddy. But Daddy first heard it from God. Yeah. Amen. So he brings a lamb. Oh, hallelujah. What are we talking about? We're talking about the pictures, the types, and the shadows in the Old Testament of what they put their faith in, that promise which was to come, and the pictures that the Lord would show us in this. We first learn it in the very beginning in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, and now we see it with their children. Listen to what it says. He brought the first things of the flock and the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Now you can argue with me today, but I believe that Cain knew what kind of offering to bring. For whatever, whatever reason, maybe he thought he knew better than God. Man does that. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Maybe he thought he knew better than God because we do that sometimes. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. He brings the best he's got, but it's not what God wants. Mm -hmm. Right. And he gets mad. Mm -hmm. yeah. He gets yeah. mad. Mm -hmm. How many times have we, like little babies, mm -hmm. sat somewhere mad and sold up mm -hmm. because things didn't go our way instead of us doing God, things God's way, we did things our way and it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't understand why God didn't because God has a order and a certain way that things have to be. And whenever we, whenever we, we get away from that, whenever we believe that our way is better than His, we'll be rejected every time. It will be rejected every time. And listen to me. He said he had respect unto Abel's offering, but he had but unto Cain's offering he had no respect. Cain was wroth, he was mad. The best that he had was not good enough. The work of his hands was not good enough. We see two completely offerings offered to the Lord. One offered of the flesh. And one offered through faith. And the flesh will never be respected when it comes to justification. 
through the Lord. It must be through faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. The just shall live by faith. Not by deeds and works of the law or man, is man justified, but justified by faith. Cain gets angry, frustrated, because his best wasn't good enough. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art why are thou wroth? What are you mad for? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? In other words, if your faith is rightly placed in obedience to that which I have laid out, you will be accepted. But, and not just accepted, but acceptance is sure, is sure because this is what God's telling him. If your faith is rightly placed, acceptance is assured. If not, then rejection is just as sure. And if thou doest not well, he said, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt have rule over him. Thou shalt rule over him. Now, God is teaching Cain here. What you offered me was not good. But if you do well, if you follow what my instruction, you will be accepted and not rejected. We don't find him we don't find him, the Lord, casting out Cain and, sit, and, and sending him forth in, in, uh, in, in, in the judgment that he puts upon him. We don't find that until he rejects completely what God has. Because after he tells him, if you do well, if you offer the right sacrifice, if you put your faith in the right... You may be out there today and you have put your faith in the best that you can do and it's not good enough. But I'm telling you today, if you will put your faith in Jesus Christ and His righteousness, then it will be well with you. You can have that righteousness. You can have that justification and that sanctification today. But Cain doesn't do that. Cain doesn't go back and make things right. When he finds out this is not good enough, Cain doesn't go and get the offering that God wants. You know what he does? He kills his brother. He kills his brother. Why? Because he's mad and jealous, full of wrath or whatever, at his brother. Because God accepted what his brother offered. But he didn't accept what he offered. And the only reason God accepted Abel, the Bible doesn't say anything about Abel being a better person. It doesn't say that Abel was a holy man. And Cain wasn't. No, it teaches us that Abel put his faith in the right place. That he stands there at the altar with the blood of the Lamb, which was a picture and a type of the cross to come. And that's where his faith was at. And that made him justified. That caused him to be accepted by God. Then we have the, the altar of Cain. He stands there offering God the best he has. The best he can do. And that's rejected by God. Always has been. Always will be. Adam and Eve's fig, leaf, fig leaves were rejected by God. <clears throat> Cain's offering of the fruit of the ground was rejected by God. Because God has, and don't ask me to explain it all because I can't. I don't have the mind of God. His thoughts are above mine. But I know that it takes a sacrifice for sin. I know that that sacrifice was shown to us in pictures and types throughout all of the Old Testament. And I know that that sacrifice was completed and brought to perfection on the cross of Calvary when Jesus Christ said that it was finished. So all of those before look toward the cross, the promise to come. All of, the, all of us today, we look toward the cross and the, and the promise that was fulfilled there. Because our righteousness, it wasn't good enough for Adam and Eve. When they sold their fig leaves. It wasn't good enough for Cain whenever he brought his offering of the fruit of the ground. It's not good enough for you today either. When you stand before a just and a holy God, your resume won't do you no good. Your resume will not do you any good. Because even though in this life, Brother Rodney, we, we receive great cards, we receive promotions in our work, evaluations that are... And we receive those promotions... Because of our own merit and the things that we have done. 
We will receive eternal life only through what Jesus Christ has done. And nothing we can add to, for, add to that and nothing that we take away. Because faith in that is all that really matters. And if you miss this, you miss the whole thing. I'm closing, I promise. The scripture that I believe that we've read every time that we've done we've been doing these teachings, Galatians 2 and 16. It says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, <coughs> and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Only through Jesus Christ. Not of our works, lest any man should boast. I want to leave you with this. Pastor and hymn writer Edward Moat, born in London, January the 21st, 1797. His parents managed a pub, what we would call a beer joint, and often left him to run the streets on his own. As he grew up, he became a cabinet maker and he worked in London for many years. Later, he entered into the ministry and became a pastor. And I wanted to share this with you. He became a pastor at a Baptist church in Horsham. For 26 years, he was the pastor there. And he was so well liked by the congregation that they gave him the church. This is what he said. He said, I do not want the chapel. I only want the pulpit. And when I cease to preach Christ, then turn me out of that. If you're preaching any other message today than Christ and Him crucified, you have no business preaching. Mm -hmm. really? He would write over a hundred hymns and His most well-known one would be this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, my righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils His lovely face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, His covenant, His blood support me in the overwhelming flood. When all around me, my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. If you're counting on anything other today than Jesus Christ and His righteousness today, you're trusting in the wrong thing. Put your faith in Jesus. Faith in His blood, in His sacrifice, His finished work. That's what saves us. Not being a great person, not doing good works. Good works are great and we need to do those. They will follow after we put our faith in the right place. Otherwise, we do them in vain. Anyone else this morning have something before we go?